Hi there. I'm Jim Zirin. Welcome back for more conversations. Writer, journalist Jeffrey Frank is with us. Jeffrey has written a marvelous biography of our 33rd president entitled The Trials of Harry S. Truman. Eleanor Roosevelt said of Truman, with every decision he grew until to the entire world he was a towering figure. The nearly eight years of Truman's presidency were momentous. For better or worse, we live out his legacy today. I'm pleased to welcome Jeffrey Frank to the program. Well, Jeffrey, uh, congratulations on your book. It was really a terrific read. And um, I wondered first, uh, what brought you to write it? There have been other biographies of Truman. There was Donovan's biography in uh, 1977, and then you had uh, McCullough's biography. Uh, in 1992, and McCullough is the gold standard of biographers, uh, people say. Uh, what did you think you could add to the mix? Well, I think you just said it. I mean, McCullough's, Donovan's book was, was, was quite wonderful. Donovan was, Donovan, as you know, was a reporter for the Herald Tribune, the, the much late lamented Herald Tribune. He was, he was there. He was a witness to that time. But it's, but it's very much limited by, by what a journalist could see. David McCullough's book, was a cradle to grave biography, and there's nothing, no one's ever going to do that again. I, I certainly didn't attempt to do it. I, mine is sort of more a biography of a presidency. But David McCullough's book is 30 years old. There's a lot to be learned from that since that time. Well, uh, McCullough was responsible for largely resurrecting uh, Truman's reputation because when he left office, uh, uh, his approval ratings were undoubtedly low. Uh, and there was the mess in Washington. People thought that he'd uh, uh, lost China. Uh, there were all sorts of uh, adverse judgments about his presidency. And then McCullough said, oh, no, he was terrific. Uh, so uh, what do you see as Truman's signal accomplishments? Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I'll give David McCullough credit for sort of cementing this sort of positive view. It was, it was even, even as Truman was leaving office, people were saying, listen, he's, he's actually done a lot. People were already celebrating the Marshall Plan and, and other things. But yes, I, I don't, Truman, Truman gave us a, you know, 70 years of pretty, of stability I, in many ways. I mean, I think, I, I, I'm, not gonna, I'm not gonna say he conceived of the Marshall Plan, he didn't conceive of NATO, but he, but he listened to his advisors and these things happened. And it, meant, it meant a lot. It gave a lot of stability to the world, to, to, to not only to the Western world, but to the Eastern world. There was, and there was really no, uh, no serious war. And, and, and certainly, most of all, there was no nuclear war. Uh, well, the subtitle of your book is The Extraordinary Presidency of an Ordinary Man. Why don't we tackle first, uh, in what respect was uh, Truman ordinary? He was very much, I, I, we use, I use the phrase in the sense of someone who simply, who, who, was, who, was, who was very much a middle American. He actually, he, he, he grew up on a farm. He, he never graduated from college. He was, uh, he, 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 worked, he worked hard. He worked, he, he was a family man. He was a, something very unusual. He was devoted to his wife uh, forever and ever. And he was an honorable, honest man. And he was, he was something very, Ordinary in the sense that we've actually forgotten what that what ordinary means in, in modern America. But he, he kept his word. And that was an ordinary thing in those days, too. The man from Missouri. Now, uh, what about uh, his uh, principal characteristics? Did they resemble Missouri? Was he a Missouri mule, a, a stubborn man? Um, uh, I don't know. Those are, I mean, those are, those are all things. I think, I think what he, I think he, he certainly, certainly was a stubborn man. And uh, but I don't. I think people from other other states are stubborn too. He was he was a he was a he was a full fledged American, and he and he and and he said he said that himself. He was a he was he was the real thing. And I think and, and I think we don't, we sort of know it when we see it. Well, one reporter said he came to the presidency with no usable background. You know, quote this in the book or usable information. What did he bring to the table? I'm sorry, that's, that's actually to Roy Roberts, who was an editor of the Kansas City Star. He's a man who came to the presidency having for 10 years done looking, but looked at the backside of a horse when he, he had lived on this thing. What he, and, and, and what he brought to the presidency was actually kind of toughness. One of the things that I, one of the things that I learned about Truman when I was out in Missouri was to, um, 
a, 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 a wonderful guy who worked for the Department of the Interior took me, he, took me into his boyhood home in Grandview, which was closed off to the public. And I sort of going through that house and climbing the back stairs and seeing where he, where he had lived for 10 years. He shared a room with his brother Vivian. Uh, they shared a bedpan. And they would and, and they would come down it, they, in in the summer. It must have been unbearably hot. In the winter, they, there was one 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 stove downstairs. And this was, by the way, a fairly prosperous farm. And this made him tough. The other thing that he brought to the presidency was something that just that he hadn't planned on, and that was leadership. He had served in World War One, and he hadn't expected to be. Uh, be, be a, 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 he, 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 his, his eyes were bad, he, he, but he got into the army. He was in the National Guard, and he was shipped off to France. And, and here was, here's this Baptist from Missouri winning the allegiance of, of Catholics, Irish Catholics from all over, from all over uh, 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 Missouri. And he became a, a leader. And, uh, and, and that's, that stayed with him. When he, as though he, he, he realized he could actually do this sort of thing. And that was really important to, to Truman. Well, I think it's uh, fair to say that he was uh, an undistinguished senator. Uh, and yet Roosevelt chose him to uh, be his running mate uh, in 1944, um, and uh, in Roosevelt's uh, last election, uh, and it was from Roosevelt's death, of course, that he ascended to the presidency. What impelled Roosevelt to choose him? Well, I wouldn't call him undistinguished, by the way. He had a very undistinguished first term as senator. In his second term, when he, which began in 1940, he actually took charge of what became known as the Truman Committee, which was looking at, basically, to use the modern phrase, waste, fraud, and abuse in the defense industry. This began before, before the war started, and he found a lot of it. He was on the cover of Time for this, and he was, and he was recognized as someone who really, who, he, he was scrupulous. He was, a, he was a detail man. He was a detail man when he was, when he was basically a, a commissioner in Missouri looking after road construction. So, but, but Roosevelt also chose him for very practical reasons. He was trying to get rid of his vice president, Henry Wallace, who, was, who had a reputation as Unfairly, but basically, sort of a borderline fellow traveler, and but basically a very sort of an unusual type. Someone, the social critic Dwight McDonald's Dwight McDonald's, and he brought he brought he had a his belief system was a mixture of Protestantism, Buddhism, Zoroastrianism, and several other things, and that was and he had he was a very sort of odd guy. And then the other the other man, the other candidate was a guy named James Francis Burns, to whom Roosevelt had actually promised the vice presidency, and then Roosevelt lied to him. He realized that James Francis Burns, Jimmy Burns, had certain flaws among the, among others, that he was a he was a segregationist. So um, and uh, and so he would have lost the black vote. And he uh, he had opposed the uh, anti-lynching bill, the NAACP. The Walter White hated him. Anyway, so he 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 was not going to be a good choice, even though Roosevelt never really Roosevelt never never was never really straight with him. So Truman was a great compromise choice. He was a border state senator. He and uh, labor was he was okay with labor was okay with Truman. They didn't like Burns at all, and sort of and sort of moderate Democrats could could live with him. They couldn't have lived with with Henry Wallace, and uh, and there was a real movement to get rid of Wallace after 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 one term. So he was in a way. So Truman was Roosevelt's third vice president. John Nance Garner two terms. Wallace, Wallace one term, and then uh, and Truman. And then Roosevelt did him, did him no favor. By naming Rose, by naming Wallace Secretary of Commerce, so Truman was stuck with a man who thought he should be president in his cabinet. So you had uh, strange bedfellows in the Democratic Party. Then you had uh, uh, way to the left, Henry Wallace. Uh, there were whispers that he might be a communist. Of course, it was the time of the Red Scare and the paranoia. And uh, on the right, you had a basically a racist. Uh, possibly segregationist, uh, Jimmy Burns, very ambitious, wanted to be president. Uh, and so Roosevelt made his choice right down the middle. Yeah, and actually Jimmy Burns was, wasn't even the extreme. The, 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 uh, Strom Thurmond, the uh, governor of South Carolina, was, was, a, was sort of to the right of the Democratic Party. And as you know, he broke away from the party in 1948. But it was a, it was a very mixed, mixed bag. It was, it, and of course, these people all became Republicans. I mean, the, uh, this, this wig of the party left, and, uh, and, the, and it never came back. Let's talk about uh, Truman's uh, accomplishments. Uh, you referred to uh, the Marshall Plan. And actually, when you look at his accomplishments, uh, the issues he confronted are very much the issues we're confronting today in the uh, Biden administration and the world at large. But uh, you mentioned the Marshall Plan, 
Uh, it was about $13.3 billion in grants and loans. Uh, this year marks the 75th anniversary of Marshall's speech at Harvard, uh, where he talked about uh, uh, aid uh, to uh, the uh, European economy uh, because he thought that with, uh, without economic strength, uh, there would be no political strength and they couldn't actually stand up against the Russians. Uh, so the rivalries uh, among the uh, European powers and, uh, and Russia uh, were there even under the Soviet Stalinism. Uh, but um, so we have the uh, Marshall Plan with great success. It raised, in four years, raised the European economies on some 32 percent. Uh, but uh, was it Truman's view or did he come to the view that it was the obligation of the United States to raise the economic strength of the world? And how do you compare it with the issues that confront us today in trade? Actually, I, I, one of the things I learned that really was really found interesting was that Truman, Truman not only, Truman wasn't actively pushing for the so-called Marshall Plan, but he didn't even know when, when Marshall gave his speech at Harvard, he hadn't even shown Truman a copy of it. He actually apologized to him. I found a, a memo in which he in, in, in which he said, I'm, "Basically, I'm sorry." And Truman said, "Truman, who loved Marshall, thought he was a, he thought he was the, the the greatest Roman of them all." So don't 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 worry about it. But and Truman Truman was actually was the, the the expense of the Marshall Plan worried Truman, but he quickly began to see the the value of it. And uh, and and uh, and so and yes, it was it was it was maybe the most I would say I would say it was the most important thing. Uh, uh, Thing that happened during the Truman the Truman Truman's first term well, was nothing. It was nothing like it. And and we've always I, I think we asked the question: What would a country with unlimited power and unlimited wealth do? And the United States answered that with a, with a wonderfully generous and pragmatic. I mean, it was useful to us too. Uh, policy and that was the Marshall Plan. Now there was bipartisan support for the Marshall Plan, wasn't there? Uh, eventually, uh, uh, Dewey and even Taft and uh, Herbert Hoover. Uh, all endorsed the Marshall Plan. Uh, it was interesting. Even Congressman Richard Nixon took a took a tour with the uh, with the House Committee led by Christian Herter, and he was completely knocked out. I mean, by, by knocked out in, in the worst way by seeing how much suffering was going on in Europe. But he became a he became a big supporter of the Marshall Plan. The most important person was probably Senator Vandenberg of of, of Michigan. He was the he was the uh, the chairman of the. Well, in, in 1946, when they lost, when the Democrats lost the lost Congress, he became the chairman of the Foreign Relations Committee, and he was uh, he was very important. And he was uh, he'd been an isolationist, and became a huge internationalist. And, and yeah, he, it was real. He famously, real he famously said that politics ends at the water's edge. Yeah, and, and those uh, so the, he supported Truman in a bipartisan foreign policy, and which emerged then for the first time, and that uh, basically continues. Uh, to this day, there's bipartisan support for uh, uh, Ukraine and our policies with Ukraine. So uh, yeah, a little wobblier, a little more wobbly than it used to be, and uh, that it's uh, and and uh, yeah, and we had a we had a sort of we had a period where our president seemed to be maybe a little bit too cozy with the Ru Russian leader, uh, and but that and but he's gone now. But no, I mean, but that that policy is wobbly but still intact. I, I like to think it is anyway. Now, uh, one vocal uh, opponent of the Marshall Plan uh, was the Soviet Union. Molotov uh, walked out of the, the conference to which they were invited in uh, 1947. Yeah, I mean, the Soviet Union looked at what was the so-called Truman Doctrine was even that and, and the Marshall Plan. And it, the, the, the funny thing, or it was not so funny, you know, they were actually thought of inviting, of inviting Soviet Union to be part of it, to send, to send aid to Russia. And uh, to to the great relief of uh, of General Marshall and others, the Russians said no. But we would have helped. We would have done it if the Russians said, "Sure, we're we're in." We would have sent them. They would have been part of it. Uh, you mentioned the Truman Doctrine. That uh, was Greece and Turkey, and it was uh, the United States' uh, willingness uh, to use uh, military force really to uh, keep uh, communism, Soviet communism, and the Russians uh, out of other countries. Actually, it didn't go that far. Uh, yeah, that was the, the fear. People like Senator Taft said, does this, does this mean military force? And at Dean Atchison, the Secretary of State said, or actually he was the Under Secretary of State then, said, no, no, we're not, we're, we're talking about sort of giving them, giving them aid because the, the United Kingdom, England had backed out of supporting Greece and, Greece and Turkey. 
And so, no, no, we were not going to say we were not going to be sending military aid, or we, we declared. And in fact, this was not a un, this was not universally applauded. I mean, um, some people thought this was going to people like George Kennan worried that this was going to open the door to to and he saw the future, all kinds of involvement in in other other people's wars, other people's problems, and 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 and, and, and an increasingly large commitment by the United States. And uh, and and uh, Admiral Bill Leahy, William Leahy, who was who was Truman's chief of staff, was actually far more worried about China. This was two years before Mao Zedong had 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 won. But he said having a but he could see what might happen. He said having a Soviet-style state in in China it was of far more concern to us than what might happen in Greece or Turkey. Now uh, uh, the Democrats lost the midterm elections. Yeah. Uh, it's projected uh, that uh, the Democrats might lose the midterm elections uh, this year. Uh, is there a parallel there uh, between Truman and Biden and how it's necessary, it might be necessary to govern from the center rather than from the left? Yeah, I mean, the, I mean the, the yes and no. I mean, yeah, uh, Truman, Truman lost, I mean, the, the, the Democrats lost Congress for the first time since 19, 1928. And the loss was so large that actually there were some, some people saw this as, as a, vote of, a vote of no confidence in Truman. That was, don't forget, Truman had only been in office for a year and a half at this point. And, um, and Roosevelt had died in April of 45. The election was November of 46. And it was the election, the overturn of, I mean, the, this, the, the, the switch in the, in the balance of power was so strong that one, uh, one Democrat, uh, um, Senator Fulbright of Arkansas, suggested that Truman should, uh, should uh, appoint Van Senator Vandenberg, who, who we talked about, as Secretary of State. In those days, Secretary of State was the next in line to the president. That's changed since then. Let's talk for a moment about the recognition of Israel, uh, yeah. which has been hailed as uh, another one of Truman's uh, signal accomplishments. Now, uh, Secretary of State uh, Marshall at the time yeah. Uh, was uh, uh, vehemently opposed to uh, the United States recognizing Israel. Uh, why did he do that? Actually, yeah, he, he was. And by the way, he wasn't alone. Under Secretary Atchison was opposed to it. Uh, James Forrestal, the Secretary of Defense, was opposed to it. They all thought this was they all thought this was a, a terrible policy. It was going to set off, you know, uh, divisions in the Middle East uh, between Arabs and Arabs and, and, and Israelis that would last for decades. They were right, of course, and. Uh, and and uh, but but and, and so they saw just completely as a question of pragmatic foreign policy. Truman once said, and I've I've I've, I've talked about this before, that there are two two people sitting in this seat in, in in the White House. There's the President of the United States, and there's Harry Truman, and uh, and I think in the case of Israel, Harry Truman made that decision. It wasn't the, it, it, it was a very personal and somewhat emotional decision, and that's what and that's what that's what did it. He was he was affected by uh, by uh, the the sites of, of refugees in in Europe after the war, that, and that and there were there was a publicized uh, it was a famous ship that was, that was trying to make its way from from Europe to Pal then Palestine, and he was and he was very much um, influenced, I'm sure, by his friend Eddie Jacobson, with whom he had opened up a haberdashery shop in in uh, Kansas City. And uh, and who, and Ada Jacobson's got him to sort of meet with Chaim Weitzman, the president or the would-be president of Israel, and Truman was if all of this influenced Truman. Even though Truman, by the way, became extremely impatient with Zionists and with the kind of lobbying he was getting, but nevertheless, he he did it. Was there anyone in his administration who uh, uh, strongly advocated the recognition of Israel? I'm not sure. I mean, Clark Clifford, who was one of his aides, did. But Clark Clifford was a uh, Clark Clifford was a was a uh, as we were saying wheeler dealer even then, and he looked at, and he actually took credit for a for an electoral, basically electoral projection, it's basically saying we need the Jews, we need the blacks, we need the Catholics, and so that was and that was that was that was his outlook. That was that was not Clark Clifford's memo, but he took credit for it. Isn't the influence of Eddie Jacobson somewhat overblown? I think you point out in the book that he really didn't have much contact with them. They were in the haberdashery business, but uh, the business went bankrupt. Uh, yeah. And there hadn't been a lot of contact between them up until the time that Jacobson came to the White House to lobby for yeah, the recognition. Yeah, Margaret Truman said Margaret Truman said that there was very little contact, but that's not. A. Jacobson did. He came. He came several times to the White House, mostly just to say hello. Truman invited him to Key West, and that's the that. And he only he wasn't going to have people coming to Key West who weren't who weren't genuinely his friends. And he spoke of 
Eddie Jacobson as being one of one of the one of the one of his most one of the closest friends he's ever had. So I think that was that was important. Uh, now another event which occurred during the presidency was uh, the firing of General Douglas MacArthur. Maybe you can talk a little about that. Yeah, well, General Truman, Truman in his private diaries had had always thought didn't like MacArthur. I mean, he, he never met him, but he, he called him, he called him, you know, self-aggrandizing bunco man and so on. But MacArthur had this, was, was, was sort of a legendary uh, uh, general. And and when North Korea attacked the South in, 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 uh, in late June of 1950, MacArthur was the Pacific commander. So there was nowhere to turn. MacArthur, if, if America was going to get involved and America did get involved, as we all know, MacArthur, MacArthur was, got the role, got, got that job. Um, that, that that war that war was was a, dis a disaster in, in my view. It um, it could have it it it, um, it could have ended very quickly. MacArthur had one brilliant military move in September of 1950, the the so-called the Inchon landing, and that and after the the North Koreans had basically taken over the entire country, the war turned around after that landing. Then and and the South the the, the the UN forces led by MacArthur in the South had basically turned the war around, and the war could have ended. And, and there were warnings to Truman from indirect warnings from China, don't go any further, don't cross this, the 38th parallel, which had been established between North and South er, earlier. And, and MacArthur then thought after, after Inchon, we could take over the whole country. The, 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 the intention of, of the war was to push them back. The analogy, I, I realize the analogy is really the first Iraq war and the second Iraq war. The first Iraq war was to push the Iraqis out of Kuwait. The second Iraq war was to have was to have a regime change. The, the Korean War should have been to push the North Koreans out of the South, to push them back over the 30th parallel, and that was done. But then it became a regime change, and that and then all hell broke loose. 37,000 Americans died, hundreds of thousands of Koreans died, maybe over a million Chinese died, and we obliterated, obliterated village by village the all of North Korea, which explains explains maybe why Kim Kim Jong Il their family hates us so much and why that has never stopped. Let's move on to another Mac, uh, actually a Mac who supported uh, MacArthur, uh, Senator McCarthy. Uh, and what was uh, Truman's relationship with Senator McCarthy? I, I think uh, uh, we should note that McCarthy uh, said uh, that uh, uh, MacArthur's dismissal in the dead, vast, and middle of the night was a symptom of national decline and a weakness in our leadership, explained by a conspiracy so immense and an infamy so black as to dwarf any such venture in the history of man. Uh, yeah. So there was a connection. Uh, maybe you can talk a little bit about their relationship. But that, by the way, that's, that's, yeah, that speech was basically the, 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 the infamy so black was an attack on General Marshall. And, that, uh, and um, that was McCarthy. I quoted some of that in the book because it's. Uh, I actually went back into the congressional record to find it because it's quite. It's, it's quite insane. Um, yeah, McCarthy. McCarthy and Truman really didn't have. In a way, McCarthy really didn't reach his apogee until Eisenhower. True, McCarthy made his famous. There, I, there was, I have a list of communists in the State Department. In 19, he made that in 1950. But he, but but the but but he really didn't really let really didn't get going until the Eisenhower administration. Yeah, Truman despised him, and uh, and he was on the move. But he his his influence wasn't all that wasn't all that great in, during the Truman during the Truman years. Truman but, could see Truman could see what, that he was a dangerous man, and he definitely did say all those things. But he 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 really became. He really reached his sort of peak of his danger in the, in the Eisenhower years, and that also was when he was the Army McCarthy hearings. That, that, that was also the end of him. But, Jeffrey, uh, recently and uh, even today, we're beset with a, a paranoia politics. And, of course, that was the time of uh, the Red Scare and this sort of notable event, which you recount in the book, uh, when uh, General George Marshall, who all his life had been a political independent, uh, was nominated for Secretary of State and appeared before the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. Uh, Senator Jenner, a far-right uh, senator from in Indiana, uh, said to him, uh, uh, General, will you assure the people of America and assure this committee uh, that you will not be dominated by Dean Acheson, who uh, uh, said he would not turn his back on Al Jahis? I mean, there's nonsense, and the yeah. nonsense persists. 
Okay, so I have a question for you, Jeffrey Frank. Uh, reading McCullough's biography, uh, reading the tea leaves, uh, reading your brilliant book, uh, one can conclude quite uh, creditably that uh, Truman was one of our greatest presidents. Uh, he may not have been strategic, but he made a lot of tactical decisions which proved to be right in the long run. Uh, yeah. Would you rank him? Would you rank him? My question is: Would you rank him as one of our greatest presidents? I would, sure, I would say he was, a, he was a very good president. I, I get very worried about these rankings because they change all the time. He was a good man and a very good, you know, a, a very good president. But after, but after we get past Lincoln and Washington and probably FDR, it's sort of hard. But yeah, Truman was was real good. He was a good guy and a good president, and we were lucky to have had him. But but there are others. You know, I would say Eisenhower. We were really lucky to have had Eisenhower and think how that ranking is going up and down. So he's sure, but I'm definitely pro Truman. A pro Truman, a good guy and a good president. Jeffrey Frank, sure. thank you so much for coming by. Thank you for coming by. Tune in next week for more conversations. Please visit our website at conversationswithjimzyron.com. All the best, take care and be well.